Greetings, my friends, and welcome to Love and Comfort 2, Translucent Cane Work Nightlight with Stories. Our stories are by Beulah Lee Harris, and we thank her so much for them. If you want to make translucent cane, I've got a couple videos, and you'll find links in the description box below. And you know, I can't think of much of anything less interesting than watching me lay out uh, paper-thin strips of polymer clay cane work on a glass face. But you know, that's kind of the point, is that uh, we don't have to think about anything right now. You can watch if you want to, or just lay back, relax. Um, I'll read you a couple of stories, and uh, we can forget about everything for a while. Because I don't know about you, but uh, this is about the strangest period of life I've lived through, and I think it's age 65, uh, that's saying something, really. So let's have our story. Let's just get away for a while. This one's called The Dreamwalker. Gentle sea breezes picked up the scent of wild cherry blossoms as they blew inland, much to the delight of Dolly May, who loved her walks to the village of Rye Bay. Dolly was an ordinary woman with an ordinary life, but what made her extraordinary was her kindness and her positive outlook. She saw goodness and beauty in everything, and it showed. It did not take much to make Dolly happy. Some said that they had never known a person with a sweeter disposition, and that her contentment was a rare lesson for the more financially fortunate who were often dissatisfied with their lot. Dolly's life was simple. Perhaps that's what made her so happy, but it was her daydreaming too. Every Saturday, Tuesday, and Thursday morning, she took a long walk to the village to get the few supplies that she needed. Once a month, she took the bus, but that was only when her pension came in and she could do a four-bag shop. Other than that, she walked, and she loved to walk. As Dolly walked, she daydreamed. She'd been on huge adventures during her walk. She'd been on cruises, she traveled to India, she bought exotic spices and shopped for silk in China. She started her own animal shelter and bird sanctuary. She met with the Pope and Elton John. She even had visited Buckingham Palace and met the Queen. And while she was doing all this, she never forgot to smile at the people she passed by. She never failed to stop and enjoy the scent of the cherry trees when they blossomed and often picked up some blossoms to take home to scent her bath with, or dry out and make potpourri parcels as gifts for her friends. Sometimes, if her purchases cost less than usual due to specials, the children in her village got some lollipops. She loved the children and often stopped to talk to them, and they loved her too, and they were polite to her even when she had no sweets to share. Today, Dolly was dreaming about winning the lottery. Oh, what she would do with all that money, the good she could do. Yes, she would certainly start an animal shelter, but she'd also spoil her children and her grandchildren rotten, and she'd buy houses for them and new cars and clothes and chocolates. Her mouth watered at the thought of endless boxes of liquid-centered chocolates and licorice and nougat. When Dolly got to the shop, she was asked if she wanted her usual. Yes, please. They were very kind in this shop, and gathered her groceries for her, and she soon walked out with her loaf of bread, a pint of milk, three apples, six eggs, and her weekly lottery ticket. Dolly stopped and sat on a bench, enjoying watching the seabirds before making her way home. On the morning that Dolly's life changed, she checked her lottery ticket numbers in the Daily Times as soon as it was delivered. This time she did not smile and make a cup of tea, and say, oh, well, maybe next time. This time, her numbers matched all the numbers. And there was only one winner. Dolly did not bother with her morning tea. She did not even brush her teeth or wash her face. She was in such a hurry to get to the village and check with the shop that there was no mistake. All the way there, Dolly tightly clutched the handbag that held the lottery ticket and the newspaper. She imagined what she could do with the money, but her enjoyment was soon overtaken by the fear that it might not be true, that it was a mistake, and that she was getting her hopes up for nothing. No, Dolly told herself, think positive. It has to be true. It was there in the newspaper, was it not? 
Ooh, if it was true, she could buy anything she wanted today because within a week she would be rich. She could buy chocolates and nougat and creamy strawberry yogurt and blueberry muffins. But she cautioned herself, it would not do to be greedy. It would be very silly to get into the habit of wasting money. Yes, imagine that. Imagine if she spent all her money and then had nothing left for the last years on earth. By the time Dolly arrived at the shop, she was breathless, not just from the unusually brisk walk, but from anxiety, too. Her fears were soon allayed. She was taken into the manager's office, where she was sat down and told the procedure and advised what to do to claim her money. Two million pounds. She would have to get a bus into the city and make her claim at the lottery office on Monday. Dolly was shaking from shock, but she refused a cup of sweet tea and the lift home. As she made to leave, she was asked, not wanting the usual today, Mrs. May? Dolly thought about the bread going stale at home, but it would not do if she, it would do if she cut the mold off and she could just do without eggs too. She shook her head at the red juicy apples. She had to be careful with money. Oh no, no, just half a pint of milk, please. Clutching her handbag tightly to her chest, she walked home with her head bowed, not looking at anyone. She ignored the children as they greeted her and nearly jumped out of her skin at any sign of movement near her. She did not stop to look at the sea. She did not smell the scent of the cherry blossoms. She kept looking behind her in case anyone knew and was following her and planning to rob her. She twisted her ankle slightly as she hurried along and she tripped on a cobblestone and she nearly fell. Dolly was close to tears when she got home, the day her life changed. That afternoon, she bolted her doors firmly shut for the first time ever. The end. So, gee, <laughs> was that depressing? Well, you know, I, I don't really think it was depressing, but I know someone that that kind of happened to. I mean, on a different scale, but a very good friend of mine um, won $10,000 on a scratch-off. She's going to know who she is. When she hears this, she's going she's gonna to remember this. And we hadn't known each other very long then, so I didn't want to, you know, offer unsolicited advice to her. But she came over to see me right after she had won this $10,000 scratch off. And she kind of looked grim. And, you know, I was so poor then, and I, I thought that seemed like a million dollars. And I said, how, how come you don't seem very happy? And she said, you know... <laughs> I really want to be smart. I don't want to blow this money. And yet it seems like I should, you know, get luxuries, things I couldn't normally get, but yet I could pay off bills. And, you know, I saw that the, the winning of the money um, really caused her some, some real anxiety. She, you know, she wasn't in the space to, to be joyful about it right then. And I could totally understand that. So I don't know. Uh, sometimes things aren't, you know, it'll make you feel like you think that they would make you feel. It's true, isn't it? Well, the second story is very interesting. I've never really read one like it, and I didn't know what to expect um, till the very end. But I think you really like it. It's called Confessions, also by Beulah Lee Harris. And again, I want to thank uh, Beulah Harris for offering us these beautiful stories. She's got a book on uh, Amazon, um, and it really looks good. I've sent for it. Uh, I can give you a link down in the description box. Maybe you want to, you know, maybe you want to get it because she's really a good writer. She's been good to us, that's for sure. So this story is Confessions. <clears throat> Mafia wife Gianna Russo came to confession and that triggered events that would change the young priest's life forever. Until then, it had been rather a boring morning, his first penitent being Mrs. Moss. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been a week since my last confession. I know, Father Sean Malloy thought. I know. And he listened as he did every week to much the same thing she confessed to every time. It's my breast, Father, and my voluptuous body. I cannot help but notice when men see in me and they, I look in the mirror and I'm filled with pride. Forgive my vanity, Father. He gave it the usual penance for a minor, albeit repeated offense, while trying his best not to respond in the way he was often tempted. 
He wished he could just say, ah, but there is no sin here. You are not vain, merely short-sighted. He behaved, but it was becoming harder to do. Yes, it had been a boring morning, and not the first boring day he'd had in the last few years. Father Sean Malloy thought about this time here in Little Crosby. The parishioners were mostly very kind, of that there was no doubt. Soon after arriving across the water to settle in Little Crosby for a time, his quaint cobblestone cottage was surrounded by pots of red rhododendrons and pink and blue hydrangeas. He also had more pots of scented thyme and other herbs than he knew what to do with. He hardly ever had anything from the grocery store. Many a morning he opened his door to find gifts of fruits and vegetables, eggs, wine, casseroles, all with notes from them saying, we'll collect the dish later in the week. Some stopped by to visit often with something on their minds, but always with treats in their hands, biscuits, sweets, cakes, and pies. Let's get some meat on those skinny bones of yours, Father. Now, after a few years of endless casseroles, cakes, and pies, the comments were more like, glad to see you're eating so well, Father. He loved his parishioners, make no mistake there, but it did all become a bit tedious at times. Could he never just have time to himself to read a good spy novel or watch quiz shows? By the time he had finished with this lot, he was too excited at night to do anything but sleep. His only excitement was pending disaster or grave illness or death. He certainly found no joy in that. He did enjoy his Sunday services and the work that went into them, but that was all he really enjoyed anymore. As shocking or entertaining as some of the confessions were, most were time old ones. He'd heard them a thousand times before and he would hear them a thousand times again. Like Johnny Craig, I've been cheating on my wife. Molly Smith, I stole from the grocery store. Jimmy Cook, I fantasize about robbing a bank. Annie Jen Jenny Jenkins said, I hate my mother-in-law and I wish she would die. Mary Craig says, I have sex with my husband's best friend. Ian Fossick said, I lust after another woman all the time. Patrick James said, I beat my wife last night. Father Sean Malloy gave the appropriate penance in each confession, and he tried not to judge. No, it was not his place to judge. In fact, he could relate to some of these people, especially Ian Fosdick, who lusted after women. Did he himself not experience lust? And him being an ordained priest. Many times after he had seen her in church, Mary Craig, <laughs> his breath caught at the sight of her. And at night, as tired as he was, with his body begging for rest, he thought of her bottom, and his body betrayed him before he could succumb to sleep. And Jimmy Cook, who wanted to rob a bank, did he himself, an ordained priest, not sometimes fantasize about coffers of cash and what he could do with it? And not just for the poor, but for his own suppressed wants. No, he could not and would not judge these people, and mostly they were good, for all their sins. Well, not the wife beater, certainly not, you know, not him. But. Father Sean Malloy smiled his thanks as Emily, his assistant, brought him some lemonade. He went outside and sat on a white bench under the shade of an old oak, enjoying the summer breeze. Sipping his lemonade, he was thinking about the more entertaining confessions. One was from William McBride. I like to wear my wife panties, Father. Silence, waiting for an understanding nod that was never going to come. Yeah, well, when she's sleeping, I like to get out her best lacy ones, and I wear them, and I go sit outside under the stars listening to Michael Jackson singing Man in the Mirror on my iPod. Father Sean Malloy literally wet his vestments hearing that one. Emily appeared again and he thought she was coming to call him for lunch, but he no longer felt hungry after his recent thoughts. Father, sorry to disturb you, but there's someone here to see you. Emily looked worried. It's Mrs. Russo, she whispered. Oh, right. Father Sean Malloy handed her his empty glass and headed toward the office. Everyone in the village knew that the suspected mafioso and his family had moved to, to Merseyside, but he never expected to see one of them at St. Mary's Catholic Church here in Little Crosby. No, Father, she's in the confessional. All right. Sitting on his side of the confessional booth, he hoped 
she could not hear his heart beating because it was so very loud. He knew before he even heard her speak that this was a life-changing moment. For the first time in his priesthood, Father Sean Malloy felt a frisson of fear. As she spoke, his fear grew until his palms were sweating and his brain was pulsing wildly. So last night, Tina Russo's accent was beautiful, but it was dangerously beautiful to Father Sean because he knew her words would be dangerous too. I heard it all while he was talking on the phone to a friend and now I know that my husband was responsible for the bombing of that restaurant in Venice. I cannot condone this. I, I feel so helpless to kill 16 people just because. Does your husband know that you're here? He could not believe he even asked her this. No, Gianna Russell shook her head so slightly that he only saw the dark wave of her hair move. And he will not know, but he's going to come here one day soon. I know he has a lot of sins to confess. An hour later, when Gianna Russo had left and he had stopped shaking, he decided to set his afternoon obligations aside. Mary Carroll's wayward dope-smoking son who needed a uh, saving could just wait. So could the confused about Mormon speech at the town hall. It could wait. Despite Emily and her protestations as she ran after him with his diary, he headed home in a rush. He had a phone call to make and an email to send. The early hours brought the answer he was waiting for. The instructions were many, but one stood out for him. Watch your back. Watch your back. He followed the instructions very well. One year and six weeks later, Father Sean Malloy disappeared from Little Crosby. To the dismay of the sinful but mostly kind and good parishioners, he was never seen again. Was he lying ill in a ditch somewhere? Had he been robbed and thrown into the river? Was this the devil at work against a good man? Or well, what would they do now? How would the parish survive without their young, sweet priest? But they survived, and unbeknownst to them, so did he. Thousands of miles away, Father Sean Malloy was walking along a promenade in Alcantara, Brazil. But he was not Father Sean Malloy anymore. He was now a man called Samuel Goodwin. He would not be recognized as the man he was before not in Little Crosby or anywhere else. The short blondish curls were now long and black and the almost non-existent eyebrows were thick and strong, matching his hair and framing his eyes. Dark brown contact lenses replaced the pale blue irises that had lived quietly behind round specks. The small straight nose was now large and crooked and very sexy. Months of work had toned his muscles and he walked with more confidence than he ever had. Hola, Sam. A dark-haired beauty called out from across the street, raising an arm in an enthusiastic wave while holding on to a basket of fruit. Hola, bonita, maybe later. Samuel let himself into his little bed sit. He cracked open a cold beer and was about to warm and enjoy his leftover picajo when the, the call came. You certainly have set a cat among the pigeons, the voice on the other end laughed. Even the Vatican's after you now. Samuel chuckled. So it's happening soon? Yes. Congratulations, my friend. We were about to be very rich men. It happens tomorrow. Perfect. Samuel could picture it on the shelves of bookstores all over the world. Confessions by Father Sean Malloy. The end. <laughs> that was pretty cool, huh? <laughs> I like to think of this priest, you know, finally, <laughs> I don't know, finally winning, a, winning the big one. Well, my loves, thank you for letting me read to you today. I really uh, enjoy everything about uh, doing these for you. And, you know, I get to relax when I do it, too. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. I'm still doing um, a lot of, you know, actual tutorials, and you'll be seeing them. So um, look for my channel. Like and subscribe if you wish. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.